So welcome everyone to the first colloquium of the semester. And today's speaker is the wonderful Kaylee Condit. Thank you very much for joining us, Kaylee. And Kaylee comes from the University of Washington. Um, so Kaylee did a PhD at UC Boulder um, and then moved to, I think, Rice University next for a postdoc fellowship, followed by MIT for another postdoc fellowship. And then she joined the University of Washington just last year. So you can imagine she's had a pretty unusual first year as a <laughs> professor there. Um, and Katie's research is really cool because it's at the intersection of classical field geology, uh, but also petrology and geophysics, which is quite an unusual mix. Um, and she studies fluid flow and deformation in exhumed portions of the deep crust and at the subduction interface. So yeah, thanks again, Katie, for joining us. And we're gonna hear a talk today about slow earthquakes in subduction zones. Great. Well, thank you, Megan, for the invitation. Um, I'm really happy to be here. I'm gonna share my screen now. Uh, uh, okay. So you should be able to see my presentation, right? Good. And not the like presentation, not the like, Okay, great. Okay, and can you see my mouse? I just wanna make sure um, if I point at things, you can see it, great. Okay, um, well, yeah, as I said, I'm really excited to be joining you today and to talk to you about slow earthquakes um, in subduction zones. This is an area of research that's near and dear to my heart in part because I live on top of a subduction zone that has slow earthquakes or slow slip events and hosts them um, at regular intermittent periods. Um, so I'm interested in it from a, <laughs> a personal perspective, but uh, they're also just fascinating from a scientific perspective. Um, and so I wanna also just acknowledge before I get into the talk, um, my collaborators on this work. Um, so Melody French, uh, who was a postdoc at Maryland actually a couple of years ago with Wen Liu, um, is one of my main collaborators on this work. I started working on this topic with her when I was a postdoc at Rice. Um, but then I've also worked with Victor Guevara, Jonathan Delft, Cinti Lee, Lawrence Young, and Emily Chin on this work. And so there's no way that um, this project really could have taken any form without um, all of these people helping me out. Um, okay, so today I'm gonna talk about slow earthquakes and subduction zones, and I'm gonna try to take a tact of thinking about what can we tell, what are the constraints we have on these slow earthquakes or these slow slip events um, from the geologic record, so the exhumed rock record, um, from what we might know about the petrology of these zones and how these zones um, are undergoing metamorphism, and then also tie that to constituent relations or the sort of rheology or flow laws you might expect for some of the deformation features that we see within these exhumed rocks. Um, and so for a little bit of motivation, um, right, we are all familiar with subduction zones. We have oceanic lithosphere subducting underneath some overriding plate. Um, and, you know, these zones host the most devastating volcanic eruptions on earth. Um, earlier, I was just talking about how I look at Mount Rainier <laughs> sometimes when it's clear um, and how <laughs> large and sort of scary that volcano looks like. Um, but these, um, these subduction zones are also hosting the largest earthquakes on earth. Um, and these can be synomogenic um, and they can just have a lot of ground shaking. They can be really destructive and quite deadly. Um, and as someone who works on the exhumed rock record, I'm particularly interested in the plate interface and this boundary between the subducting plate and this overriding plate. Um, and this interface is really integral for these two uh, different major types of hazards. And in the way that the chemical evolution of this interface um, happens is influencing our global element cycling and what material makes it down to these arc source regions. Um, and in terms of the way these rocks flow and break is influencing the fault zone behavior. And so um, the rheology of this interface or the strength and the way these rocks actually deform is gonna influence when, where, and how we might have one of these large earthquakes. Um, and so if we look at a subduction zone in a slightly more um, detailed and maybe more realistic cartoon, um, you know, we can see that this zone of the subduction interface is, is really fluid rich. And we know this um, from uh, the rock record, certainly. We also know this from geophysical, um, from geophysical observation, but um, you know, if we look at this plate interface and and you know some cartoon depicting what it might look like at shallow depths, we know that the plate interface is a relatively narrow uh, fault zone, and then at deeper depths we transition into a ductile shear zone. Um, but this is a really lithologically diverse zone um, and a really chemically diverse zone. 
And so um, fluids along this plate interface are facilitating and influencing both the chemical and mechanical processes that are taking place along this zone. And so um, when we think about the chemical evolution of this zone and the element cycling and what might be making it all the way down to these arc source regions, um, we know these fluids are doing a lot of work here. We have water bearing minerals, hydrous minerals. We see a lot of evidence for chemical alteration and metasomatism. Um, there's you know, evidence of metamorphic reactions and loss of water and volatiles as the rocks subduct and heat up um, and those um, hydrous minerals become unstable. Um, and the way these rocks flow and break and, and their fault zone behaviors from the rock record, um, you know, we know that these rocks are locked in the seismogenic zone near the trench. Um, and uh, then at deeper depths when it gets warmer, um, ductile deformation is dominant here. So we have sort of ductile creeping at these depths and this is loading then this locked seismogenic zone, which then releases most of its energy in these large um, mega thrust earthquakes that are so dangerous. Um, what I'm interested in today talking about is this phenomenon that's happening at the transition zone between these locked um, rocks and where we have ductile deformation dominant. Um, and so these are these slow earthquakes or um, episodic tremor and slip if we're having these slow earthquakes happening on an episodic, pan, um, episodic uh, recurrence intervals um, and coexisting with uh, tectonic tremor. And so I'm just gonna introduce uh, episodic tremor and slow slip which is often called ETS. Um, so what I'm showing here on the left is a map of the earth showing the subduction zones, um, at least in 2011, where we had imaged uh, or geophysically imaged uh, this uh, slow slip and tremor or this ETS. And so ETS is a combination of these cyclical slow slip events. Um, and these slow slip events have recurrence intervals on the orders of months to years. Um, and these events themselves are occurring over weeks to months and they can release as much energy as a magnitude six or seven and a half earthquake. So they're actually releasing quite a lot of energy. This is one of the reasons why they're called slow earthquakes. Um, they're happening slowly um, because their slip rates are faster than tectonic creeping rates, but much slower than an earthquake rate. So, you know, actually in Cascadia right now, I think we're undergoing a, a, a period of ETS, but I can't feel it. Um, it's just happening underneath me. Um, but over a series of months, it's releasing a, a similar amount of energy as a magnitude six earthquake. Um, and these slow slip events, when we have ETS, are temporally and spatially coincident with, with tremor. Um, and they appear to be happening along the plate interface and at depths, um, when we talk about deep slow slip or deep ETS, these are depths um, below the locked seismogenic zone in these subduction zones. A non-volcanic tremor is a series of low frequency earthquakes, we think. Um, and the intensity of tremor appears to be proportional to the amount of slow slip that's happening within these zones. There's been some really nice detailed geodetic and um, seismic work to, to suggest this. And so what I'm showing right here is just three um, maps of three subduction zones where we have imaged um, slow slip and tremor. Um, so you can see here is Alaska right here. And you can see um, in blue, I'm showing contours of the subducting plate depth. Um, and then in, in um, purple, this is the patch um, of the subduction zone here that slipped in the 1964 um, mega thrust earthquake. And then down dip of this, you can see there's a zone where we have slow slip and tremor here occurring. We see a similar pattern in Nankai in Japan, where we have slow slip and tremor, these green and orange zones here. Um, that are down dip of these patches that slipped in these large mega thrust earthquakes. And then my favorite subduction zone, because I live here, is Cascadia, of course, where we have um, evidence of slow slip and tremor down here at these depths of, you know, um, 30 to 60 kilometers. But um, in Cascadia, we don't have historical records of a mega thrust earthquake. The last one um, was right before. Um, Western Europeans moved into this area, so we don't have any written records of it. There are oral records um, from the uh, Native American people that lived here before. Um, but until recently, we really hadn't recognized that there were large megathrust earthquakes along the zone, and there hasn't been one um, for a while, so we may be due um, 
And importantly, these deep slow slip events have preceded large mega thrust earthquakes, and they are certainly contributing to the subduction zone slip budget. So really understanding what these slow slip events are, why they might be happening, and are they loading the seismogenic zone or are they not, um, is really important for, for trying to come up with um, models of seismic hazard in these zones. Um, and so what we know from the geophysical constraints on ETS, right, um, so from the seismic and geodetic observations we have from this zone, um, is that the zone where ETS occurs in these subduction zones is really fluid rich. Um, and we know this from the seismic observations. So what I'm showing up here is just some cross sections through Cascadia showing shear wave velocities. And you can see that there's really slow shear wave velocities right you know, along here, along the plate interface that coincide with the highest proportion of um, tremor in these zones. And so um, those slow shear waves have been linked to a fluid rich environment. Um, we've seen that tidal triggering um, has actually led to slow slip events, which suggests that this environment is very low, has very low differential stresses. Um, and those two um, observations together have been used to infer that this is a zone of, of high pore fluid pressure, at least transiently. Um, and while this is not totally fully true, the majority of ETS appears to be occurring in warm subduction zones. So in zones where we have a relatively warm geothermal gradient in these currently deforming subduction zones. Okay, so this is what ETS is, and I've tried to make a case for why it's important to understand it. Um, we don't right now necessarily have a really holistic understanding of the mechanisms um, that actually produce ETS or these slow earthquakes. Um, and so from the rock record, some people have suggested um, they go out and they'll look at exhumed subduction related rocks that we think are from the right depths and probably temperatures for um, these uh, slow slip events. And they see evidence of mixed brittle viscous deformation. So here's an example from the, um, a melange in Japan that's exhumed. And you can see that there's a nice melange foliation here. This might be accommodated by viscous deformation, but then it's cross cut by these beautiful N echelon vein arrays. And so people have suggested that maybe this mixed brittle viscous deformation could be accommodating the slow slip and the tremor portions that we observe. Um, and then other workers have suggested that activation of frictional mechanisms can actually lead to slow slip if we have a velocity strengthening material um, that's not going to uh, run away into a giant earthquake, but, but is going to slowly slip. Um, and so uh, that's one of these examples here. So these are just sort of some of the um, hypotheses that people have come up with for the mechanisms for slow slip and tremor. Um, but in each of these mechanisms, um, aqueous fluids are vital to important. And this matches nicely with our geophysical observations of this portion of the subduction zone. You can see on the left, um, these veins have material that precipitated into them um, from a fluid. And um, they've also been interpreted to have formed during a period of high pore fluid pressure that's resulted in fracturing. And um, in, in the frictional realm, um, if you have an elevated pore fluid pressure, you can activate frictional mechanisms at um, much higher pressures by reducing the effective normal stress within the rock. Um, so um, what I have tried to do is think not necessarily if I go out to the rock record and I see something that flowed or I see something that broke that I can then fully say, oh, this must be solicited, this must be tremor. What I've been thinking about is is taking a little bit of a different tact and thinking more about what are the conditions of ETS. And if we can figure out what the conditions of ETS are um, from a number of perspectives, then we can start ruling out some of these proposed mechanisms um, and, and sort of narrow down the field for what might actually be producing ETS. And so what I'm interested in is what's the fluid environment of, of ETS? What's the stress environment? What are the PT conditions? What rocks are down there? Um, and what structures are, are potentially um, deforming or forming during these periods? And can we use these constraints together to try to understand what the mechanisms of, of slow slip and tremor might be? Um, and so to do that today, I'm gonna take you on a bit of a tour of some of my work. I'm gonna be talking about observations from the exhumed rock record. I'm gonna tie in some constitutive relations or um, flow laws that we have that we know about how these things deform and the relationships between stress and strain rate. And then I'm gonna tie it to some petrologic modeling that I've done in warm subduction zones to try to think about the source of the fluids that might be facilitating this high pore fluid pressures um, within these zones.
And so we're first gonna go to the rock record. Um, this is a beautiful field photograph that I showed at the beginning of this talk. This is the upper Engadine Valley in Switzerland. Um, and we're actually looking across this valley at um, an exhumed subduction interface. And so we can see we have this overriding plate, this overriding Austro-Alpine plate, and then we have the subduction interface there to the left. And actually from where I'm standing right here and taking this photograph, I'm actually also standing within this same um, subduction interface just across a, a strike slip fault here in the valley. And so to give you a little bit more geologic context, here's just a, a larger um, geologic map of this area in Europe. Um, and so, um, you know, we have uh, the Alps here and there's a, you know, a plate interface um, exhumed sort of within a lot of this dark green zone here. Um, I know Sarah's group has done a lot of work in um, Monviso down in this area over here. Um, I'm going to be talking about work in the Arosa zone, so in the central apse here um, in this area, and I'm going to zoom in to this box right here and show you a slightly more detailed geologic map to get you situated. Um, so this is a map of the Arosa zone over here in eastern Switzerland in the central Alps, um, and uh, this is a Cretaceous to Paleogene subduction plate boundary. And uh, it formed during the closure of the Paninic Ocean um, between the European and Age Adriatic plates and the Austro-Alpine Astro domain right here in gray um, that was subducting over the Paninic domain here. And then the actual plate interface contact is this dashed line here on the rocks that have been interpreted to represent um, subduction zone processes and the subduction interface is actually um, these dark green rocks in here. And so um, previous work um, from this area has, has shown that the exposure depth, uh, the subduction exposure depth, um, deepens from north to south and tr transitions from maybe 10 kilometers up here, um, where the rocks are maybe 150 degrees um, during, uh, during subduction, to much deeper conditions down here in, uh, in the south, where the rocks are maybe between 300, 400, 450 degrees, and at depths of maybe 35 kilometers. Um, and importantly, fossil earthquakes or pseudotacolite, which is a frictional melt that forms um, during seismic events, have been um, found within this overriding plate right near within 10 meters of the, of the plate interface um, between the paleo temperatures of 200 to 300 degrees. And so this has been interpreted as a fossil seismogenic zone sort of within this range. Um, so this is just a block diagram that I'm adapting from previous work by Bachman et al of the subduction zone, but this is sort of the same colors as we were seeing before what the subduction zone uh, might have looked like. So we have this overriding plate with the Austro-Alpine plate here, with this lower plate subducting. Here we have the subduction interface right here. We have this region that's preserved here. We have pseudotacolite. This might be the paleoseismogenic zone right in here. Um, and actually, if we look at observations of deformation that are preserved within this subduction zone or these subduction zone rocks, we see that we have um, evidence for pressure solution creep, which is an important deformation mechanism within these rocks sort of this whole way. We can transition into some crystal plastic deformation. Um, we have evidence for co-seismic megathrust ruptures with these pseudotacolites here. And then there's a whole bunch of veins that are occurring as we get sort of the middle of the seismogenic zone and deeper. And these observations are important because as someone who's interested in what mechanisms might be um, facilitating slow slip and tremor, understanding the rheology of these rocks, which we can pull out from the microstructures that are preserved with how they deformed, um, is key. And so I focused my work here on the deepest portion here um, that's exhumed below the exposure of pseudotacolite. So as we saw from the geophysical observations of where slow slip and tremor are occurring in currently deforming subduction zones, these deep slow slip events are happening down dip of the seismogenic zone. And so this was an area that I wanted to target here to look at what the rocks might tell us about um, whether slow slip might be hosted here and what the conditions um, might be if they were. So I'm gonna zoom in and show you an even more detailed set of geologic maps of these two sites right here in the deepest part of the Arosa zone as they're exhumed here. Um, and I wanna show you, a, you know, just a set of, of maps that I've made and some brief um, key geologic observations that we've made. So this is this first site that we were working in. Um, it's exposed at temperatures of about 300 to 400 degrees C and maybe paleo depths of 30 kilometers in the crust. You can see um, 
here's a, a cross section of what this plate interface and, and these rocks might look like. Um, the zone here is about um, a little less than 400 meters thick. It has tabular lenses of serpentinite, metasedimentary rocks, mafic schists, metabasalts, and talc schists. So it's, it's really lithologically diverse um, in this area. Um, and here's what this uh, slightly deeper site uh, or hotter site looks like. Um, this is site two, and this is another um, map, ge detailed geologic map of the exposure that we see here. And this is what a cross section through this zone looks like. Um, here, um, the plate interface is exposed at about 500 meters thick. It again has these tabular layers or lenses of serpentinite, metasedimentary rocks, multiple different kinds of metasedimentary rocks. There's lots of mafic schists, metabasalts, talc schists, and a lot of evidence for metasomatism. And so I just want to point out these, these thin talc layers are really uh, end up becoming quite important um, that we see as in some cases we think metasomatic rinds in some of these mafic to ultra mafic sequences and then in other places um, in some of associated with some of these um, metasedimentary units. Um, but I'm gonna show you a, a set of just field photos to give you a sense for what these rocks really look like when we're out there in the field and show you a lot of evidence for fluids doing some really interesting work in, in this zone. And so um, this is a photo that's taken from within the plate interface at site one. Um, and I'm gonna just overlay some annotation on it so you can see what I see. Um, so this is the contact right here with the Austro-Alpine plate. Here's the Austro-Alpine plate right here. So we're standing you know, within this uh, subduction uh, interface within these rocks. And you can see there's this big um, ledge of serpentinite in between it and eroding really nicely, which makes it hard to sample as a talc schist. And we have some blocks of mica schists and calcareous schists or, or um, uh, tabular bodies of it. There's more serpentinite over in the distance and some metabasalts that are outcropped as well. So there's a lot of different lithologies that are exposed here, which ends up, I think, being quite important for um, where deformation might be partitioned at various periods of, of uh, high pore fluid pressures. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of evidence for fluids doing a lot of work in this zone. This is a photograph from the field of a massive metabasalt, and it has um, multiple different generations and sets of veins that are cross-cutting it. Um, you can see here, there's this older epidote-rich vein that's then cross-cut by these, at a very high angle, by these um, quartz veins here. Um, the fact that we're seeing quartz within a metabasalt is suggesting that this fluid is external because it has a lot of silica within it. Um, that precipitated that quartz. So there's a lot of evidence for fluid activity within this zone. And we can compare that to what we see in this foliated calc schist. Um, and you can see rather than being massive, we have really strong fabric development within this rock. Um, and there are these uh, foliation parallel quartz and calcite veins that are being reworked during viscous deformation periods um, within this rock too. So both of these two rocks are showing a lot of evidence for um, uh, fluids being really important um, within this zone. And so what I want to talk about a little bit um, in the, the sort of field portion of this is this one specific outcrop. And so here's Emily uh, Melody French here for scale, um, looking at this, at this outcrop. Um, this is that serpentine ledge that I was showing you a photograph of the side of earlier. Um, when we were out here in the field, it was super cold. Um, <laughs> as you can tell, there was snow and it was really windy. Um, and so we'd like go over to the dark uh, serpentinite to like warm up because it was just radiating heat in the sun. And then we'd like come back over and keep working on these um, on these outcrops. Um, but what I'm showing here is a foliated politic schist that's riddled with these quartz craxial veins. Um, and so you can see this is what this face looks like here. You can see there's a, a nice uh, foliation that's developed in here and then it's cross cut by multiple um, different orientations of veins, of these quartz crack seal veins within it. And so if we zoom in and look at what the microstructures look like within this schist, um, this is a cross-polarized full thin section photomicrograph of this schist. And we can see that it's cross-cut, the foliation is cross-cut at a high angle by these blocky elongate quartz veins. So this is evidence of you know, fluids, um, both probably creating the fractures within this rock and then also filling those fractures in with that precipitate, that silica that's precipitating within them. Um, and if we zoom in even further and to look at what the, uh, the foliation can tell us and what kinds of minerals and deformation mechanisms might be um, 
facilitating that foliation, we can see that the um, mineral assemblage that's defining that foliation um, has sort of a typical like upper green schist facies um, set of, of uh, mineral assemblages, which makes sense for the PT conditions. We think this rock was, was at, we have quartz and fengite, which is a white mica, albite, actinolite, stiffnomaline, which I had never worked on. I don't know if I ever wanna work on again. Um, stiffnomaline, as best as I can tell, maybe some of your experts in it is uh, what biotite um, was when it was colder. Um, it looks a lot like biotite when it's really fine grained to me. So I spent a while trying to figure out what my probe data was telling me when I had measurements on it. Um, and then there's some apatite and, and um, titanite and a little bit of, of really late epidote within this rock. Um, but we can look at um, the microstructures that we see that are allowing this foliation to develop and, and understand something about the way viscous deformation um, was occurring within the subduction zone. Um, yeah, and I just, I said that these are sort of representative of PT conditions of 350 degrees and maybe um, nine kilobars or 0.9 GPA. Um, and when we look at parts of this, we can try to understand what the microstructures are telling us about the rheology within this rock. So just having um, these layers of this more quartz rich zones and these phyllosilicates, um, this is a really typical uh, microstructure that we see that develops during pressure solution creep, um, which is a deformation mechanism that is facilitated by dissolution of material and then reprecipitation of that material into um, the lower strain zones. And then there is some evidence if we look in cross polarized light at some of these quartz zones for some um, dislocation creep that is active where we see some um, uh, of these you know, wiggly grain boundaries between quartz veins and some undulose extinction. Um, within those quartz veins. So originally I thought, okay, there's, you know, um, dissolution precipitation creep um, or pressure solution creep that's active within this that's facilitating a lot of the deformation in quartz and then also dislocation creep in quartz. Cool, that's awesome. We figured out, you know, what might be the deformation mechanisms. Can we use flow laws to try to understand, um, you know, what the stresses and strain rates might have been when this deformation was, was occurring. Um, but then I looked at some probe data and actually realized that a lot of what I thought was quartz in, in these really fine grained zones um, actually was albite. Um, and so what I'm showing right here, this is a, um, this is a, an image from a, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. An image from a, a, a bunch of um, X-ray maps from the electron microprobe that have been combined and given false colors. So this is an aluminum, magnesium, calcium, RGB, map so all of the aluminum rich phases are given some red value the magnesium rich phase is a green value and the calcium rich phase is a blue value and it allows you to really see in some of these fine-grained rocks what the minerals are actually looking like and so you can see here um you know this uh orangey color here this is fengite this is a white mica um this green phase here this is actinolite it's really magnesium rich that makes sense um we have some apatite in here which is these sort of bluey purple zones here Oh, sorry. Um, but importantly, in black here, this is the quartz, right? Quartz doesn't have aluminum, magnesium, or calcium in it. Um, you can see that in between these zones of fengite, there's actually not that much really monomineralic zones of quartz as you might expect during pressure solution creep. And in fact, there's a lot of this red phase here, which is albite. And so albite, it looks like from a microstructural perspective, is actually potentially accommodating quite a lot of the deformation within this rock. And so um, the pressure solution creep within this rock is is potentially being um, sort of accommodated by albite, and maybe there's some later or subsequent minor dislocation creep within the quartz. Um, okay, so we can take these observations and put them together to try to understand something about the conditions of this viscous rheology and this viscous deformation um, within this rock. So what I'm plotting on here is the equivalent st a shear stress here on the y-axis and the equivalent shear strain here on the x-axis. And I'm gonna plot some flow laws for these deformation mechanisms that we saw at the conditions that these rocks were at. So about 350 degrees and pressures of about nine kilobars. And so, there's a, a lot of equations that I've just put on here, but what I'm plotting right now is just the flow laws for quartz. So these are the constitutive relationship between stress and strain rate. And so you can see here in the solid line here, I've plotted the thin film model for pressure solution of quartz. And then this dashed yellow line here is the dislocation creep. 
um, flow law for quartz. And so this is what that flow law looks for pressure solution for quartz. And there's, you know, this is a uh, strain rate and we can see we have stress over here. Um, there's a lot of constants in here and parameters that go into it. But importantly, what I want you to take away from this is that pressure solution creep is grain size dependent. What that means is that it becomes weaker when the grain sizes are smaller because we have this D, this grain size here um, in the bottom of our flow law. So at the smaller and smaller grain sizes, the weaker and weaker the rock becomes. This makes a lot of sense, right, from a sort of, um, intuitive perspective, if you have, you know, a lot of space for dissolution to happen on, a lot of, you know, small grains for dissolution and then reprecipitation to happen on, you're going to have uh, the ability to have dissolution precipitation creep to be more powerful. And then importantly, um, the stress exponent here is one. So here's our stress here. The exponent here is one. So this is linearly viscous here. And then for dislocation creep for quartz, what you can see here is that, you know, this is again, um, strain rate and stress. This is grain size independent. There's no D or grain sized term in this flow law. And the stress exponent here is four. So this is to the fourth. So this is some power law creep. Um, and this is what this looks like here when we plot it on, on the flow law. And so this is for quartz. This is for a grain size of 25 microns. Um, but what we can do is we can do the same thing for albite. So now what I've plotted on here in blue is the flow laws for albite. And this is in solid, the flow law for albite pressure solution creep. And you can see that even with the same grain size, it's a little bit weaker than the flow law for quartz. And the way we tend to think about um, viscous deformation is that in a rock, it's all sort of maybe active at the same time, but the weakest flow law or the weakest deformation mechanism is what is going to control the rheology of the rock and dominate the rheology of the rock. Um, and then you can see here in this dashed line, this is dislocation creep for albite, which is obviously much stronger. It's not really like doing much on here. Um, and the only real difference, well, there's differences in these consonants, but the, the stress exponent here for, for albite is three and not four like it was for quartz. So, so this is sort of what the relation between stress and strain looks like within these rocks. Um, with these flow laws, but what we can do is we can, oh, and Micah, we don't need to talk deeply about Micah. I'm happy to answer some questions about it, but um, the flow law we have for Micah is not um, particularly well constrained for these PT conditions, and it actually doesn't satisfy von Mises' criterion, so we tend to maybe ignore it at our own peril, but I will do that today. Um, but these are the typical stresses that we think are along the plate interface, you know, sort of in the tens of MPA. So this is sort of the stress range that we expect to be in. And then these are sort of the strain rates that um, tectonic creeping strain rates that are active along the plate interface. And so you can see nicely within this rock that if we have a typical set of stresses and these tectonic strain rates, we can accommodate these tectonic creeping strain rates with pressure solution creep in albite and maybe some pressure solution creep in quartz. And maybe we're, maybe we're accessing a little bit of dislocation creep um, within the quartz as well. And this is nice because it's super consistent with our microstructural observations that we saw here. Um, okay, but then if we think about slow slip strain rates, these are sort of typical slow slip strain rates that we might expect along the plate interface. Um, obviously slow slip is happening faster than these tectonic creeping rates. And you can see that you'd need stresses of, you know, in the hundreds to potentially thousands of MPAs, um, which we just don't have on the plate interface to have these slow slip strain rates be accommodated by viscous deformation. Um, so what that suggests is just seeing something that flows at the plate interface does not mean you've captured slow slip. It means that you've captured something that flowed um, potentially at much uh, lower strain rates than, than we see for slow slip. And um, we can take this approach and expand it to the range of uh, lithologies and microstructures that we observed here in the deeper part of the erosozone and couple these geologic observations that we are able to make in these constitutive relations to understand something about slip partitioning. Um, and this is work that was led by Melody French um, at Rice University. Um, and so what we did together is we looked at the different rocks that are exhumed within the erosozone. We built a model for an idealized subduction plate boundary at these deep slow slip conditions and thought about what the flow laws for the different minerals that we observed here and the microstructures that are preserved here suggest for um, what uh, varying pore fluid pressures might do to deformation mechanisms and where we might expect deformation to localize during slow slip events versus during um, tectonic creeping periods. And so what we see is that at low stresses and 
low to moderate pore fluid pressures, as I was just showing you, viscous deformation in these metasedimentary schists can accommodate these tectonic creeping strain rates. But um, if we have even just low to very low stresses and high pore fluid pressures, we can activate frictional deformation mechanisms, specifically in talc and chlorate that are gonna be velocity strengthening and then could easily host these slow slip events and accommodate slow slip strain rates um, within these rocks. And so I don't have time to go more deeply into this aspect, but this was published in EPSL in 2019. And so um, please go, go take a look at it if you want. And so there's partitioning of deformation between these different lithologies at variable pore fluid pressures. And so these pore fluid pressures aren't influencing the viscous mechanisms. They're not making these viscous mechanisms weaker, but they are at elevated pore fluid pressures through the lowering of the effective normal stress, allowing for these frictional deformation mechanisms to occur um, and accommodate slow slip strain rates along the plate interface. And so, you know, if we make this case that these fluids are really important and, and perhaps, you know, you need an elevated pore fluid pressure to activate these frictional mechanisms and facilitate slow slip, we can ask the question, where, where might these fluids actually be sourced from? Um, are these fluids sourced from much deeper in the plate interface um, and migrate up along the plate interface to the zone where we see high pore fluid pressures or not? And so there's a couple of options for fluids, right? We have fluids that are coming in at the trench, these shallow pore fluids right here. Um, but we think that those fluids are generally expelled, those pore fluids are generally expelled at depths of less than 15 kilometers. So that leaves these metamorphic fluids that tend to be um, pressure and temperature controlled. So these are fluids that are released during dehydration reactions um, from hydrous minerals as they transform into less hydrous minerals. Um, and stable isotopic data from the rock record uh, from exhumed rocks at this depth, even the Arosa zone specifically, um, suggests that the, the fluids here are um, metamorphic in origin. So that jives with what we think is happening with these shallow pore fluids. Um, and we actually see evidence for that. I have some stable oxygen isotope data from these very veins in this sample, um, which have a fluid value of between six and seven per mil. So this is too heavy to be uh, meteoric fluids or surface waters. Um, and actually relatively light, so it might suggest that these are coming from some mafic source um, in here. Um, but we can take sort of a, a modeling perspective to try to figure out where these fluids might be sourced if they're metamorphic and might be they be sourced quite deep or much more shallowly. And so um, these dehydration reactions are a function of the slab top PT paths. And so along this plate interface, these rocks that might be quite hydrous are gonna transform at various depths depending on the temperature. Um, and so the thermal structure of the subduction zone becomes incredibly important for understanding where we might have devolatilization reactions and potentially devolatilization reactions at the conditions of ETS that might lead to these high pore fluid pressures that facilitate slow slip. And so the approach that I took to try to answer the question of, of where might these uh, metamorphic fluids be produced, and then the question of what lithologies might contribute to these fluids the most, is to look at observations from um, currently deforming subduction zones that host ETS and look at observations of the depth of ETS um, in Cascadia, in Japan, and in Mexico. Here's just an example of Mexico. I'll, I'll talk about this figure in a little bit more detail and couple that to predictions of the locus of metamorphic dehydration at these same subduction zones. And I've done this through a combination of petrologic modeling of typical subduction lithologies and um, coupling that to geodynamic models of the thermal structure to try to understand exactly where along that specific subduction zone you might expect to have um, large dehydration reactions and produce quite a bit of fluid. And so if we just look at sort of the geophysical constraints on this for the locations of non-volcanic tremor, this NVT, this is tectonic tremor, and these slow slip events, um, this is the distribution we can see in Mexico, um, in Nankai, Japan, and in Cascadia. And I've separated each of these two subduct each of these three subduction zones into two different segments. So in Mexico, for example, we have Yalisca, Colima, and Guerrero. In Nankai, we have two patches where we have a lot of slow slip and tremor. We have Shikoku and Ki. And then Cascadia, we have the south and central portions of Cascadia. And what I'm plotting on here in these colors, this is the distribution of non-volcanic tremor 
Um, and then I'm plotting here just a uh, depth along the plate interface here. And you can see the just a histogram of that non-volcanic tremor in these zones. And then in pink, I'm showing um, where we see these slow slip events. And you can see that in general, we have non-volcanic tremor in most of these zones that's happening between 30 to 60 kilometers. Some is a little bit deeper, some is a little bit shallower, but this is a good thing to compare it to. And then these dashed lines in here and these stars, these are zones where we have geodynamic models that have predicted the slab top PT conditions or thermal structure of this zone. And so I'm using these slab top PT conditions to then along that path extract the uh, dehydration reactions that are going to occur in typical lithologies in these zones. And then we can compare where we have dehydration to where we have tremor and see if there's any um, link in location. And so um, I've done this using the thermodynamic uh, modeling software Perplex. Um, and so this is just an example of a uh, PT diagram made in Perplex for an average morb composition. And I've just contoured it for the amount of mineral bound water. So this is water that's held onto in the mineral structure of the rocks within, within uh, in the minerals within this morb over this range of PT space. And we're spanning the full depth range where we have uh, observed slow slip events and tremor. And I'm just putting on here the PT conditions of the Arosa zone, um, just for reference. Um, and importantly, I just want to state that these models are all made with uh, at fluid saturated conditions. Um, and here's just the metamorphic facies that these relate to, you know. Um, and then here are these slab top PT paths that are from these geodynamic models. And so um, what you can see here, right, is I'm showing uh, you know, some of these models, most of them are quite warm and they're sort of not even maybe hitting these blue schist facies conditions. They're more in these green schist facies, maybe epidote blue schist, and then they transition into these epidote amphibolite and then up into these eclogite facies conditions up here. And so we can couple these, um, these PT diagrams to these um, PT paths and extract the water that's produced through metamorphic dehydration reactions along these paths here. Um, and I have done this for four typical subduction zone lithologies. So I've done this for average morb, I've done this for seafloor altered morb or metasomatized morb, and then a typical metapellite and then depleted morb mantle or an ultramafic rock. And you can see broadly um, the pattern between the two morbs is relatively similar, right? We have these zones in blue schist facies where there's tons and tons of water that's held within the rock. This is mostly in lawsonite, a little bit in glaucophane. Um, and then as you move warmer and warmer, you have uh, less fluid rich zones um, where you have a breakdown of lawsonite and chlorite in these, in these areas. Um, now the depleted morb mantle is ultra mafic rock has a ton of water in it, um, not a literal ton. I mean, more than a literal ton has a lot of water in it. Um, and this is mostly held in serpentine. And then in the metapellite, um, you can see there aren't these really uh, sharp um, boundaries between zones where we have a lot of water or facies where we have a lot of water and not a lot of water, but there's more of this gradual decrease in, in mineral bound water within these rocks. And this is just what these paths look like as they traverse this PT space and, and these uh, water surfaces. And so what I've done is I've actually extracted the mineral bound water along these PT paths um, and at PT paths that are plus and minus 50 degrees. Um, so this is just to get at sort of the uncertainty that we might have in both our petrologic models or these thermodynamic models and the uncertainty that are uh, sort of come into play with these geodynamic models. Um, and so uh, what I'm gonna show you right now is um, I'm going to build this figure right now. So what I'm showing here is for each of those subduction zone segments, I'm going to show you the amount of mineral bound water in each of these lithologies that we modeled. Um, and where we have a big decrease in mineral bound water, um, that's going to be you know, a, a proxy for fluids that are released during dehydration reactions um, at those depths. And so you can see there's Guerrero and Yaliska Kalima. We have Central Cascadia, South Cascadia, and then Shokoku and Ki in Japan. And so this is the typical metapellite, the amount of water, mineral water that's bound um, along these PT paths for typical metapellite. And the dark line represents the actual line of that PT path. And then that um, the transparent zone around it is the plus and minus 50 degree envelope around it. And you can see for metapellites, there's just sort of a gradual decrease in fluids sort of along the whole zone. 
Oh, and importantly, what I'm just plotting down here is a histogram of the depth of, of non-volcanic tremor. So a way that we can correlate the depths that we see tremor and slow slip to potential zones where we see dehydration. So that's plotted for each of these subduction zones um, on the bottom. And so if we compare that metapellite to the altered morb, but what we see is that actually in the altered morb, rather than these really gradual zones, we see that there are a couple of these interfaces where we actually have, you know, maybe a release of, of one to one and a half weight percent water over a very narrow depth range or, or pressure range. Um, here, um, we see this to an even stronger extent with the average morb here, where we have these, you know, um, zones where we have a lot of fluids that are, um, you know, released from those mineral bound water um, in here and in here. And then, um, what we see in the ultramafic rocks is that there's very little um, mineral bound water that's released, except for Yaliska Kalima, where we have a lot that's released right here. This is the warmest, um, the warmest PT path of any of the samples that we saw. Um, so what I think this all suggests together is that actually you can see there's a, a pretty nice correlation between dehydration in these ultra in these mafic rocks to the location of where we see some of these tremor and slow slip zones. And so rather than requiring up dip movement of fluids that were produced at much deeper depths along the plate interface to these um, depths where we see slow slip and tremor, we might actually expect to potentially have a, a metamorphic source for these fluids that's in situ from these mafic rocks. Um, but we can zoom into key where we don't see a very nice correlation and try to understand more about what might be going on there. And so here what I'm showing you is uh, the key peninsula. This is the map here. And I'm going to show three different geodynamic models, these PT paths, and the water that's produced if we use each of these different PT paths for the same exact zone. And so here I'm showing you a model from Simon Peacock's work from 2009. And you can see this is the model we originally used, this geodynamic model, and there's very little water that's produced at these depths of slow slip and tremor. Um, this is a model from Peter Van Kecken's 2018 paper, and you can see it's it's even colder and there's very little fluid that's produced at these depths. But if we look at some of these um, models that take into account some of the uh, transient processes that are happening on this along this plate interface, like changes in subduction um, velocities and things like that, that end up actually being much warmer models, we see that there is ample dehydration in this segment if we use these warmer models. And so what I think that this tells us is that um, our choice of thermal model <laughs> is really important um, for whether or not we might see this. And so having really um, nice, uh, well uh, calibrated and as precise as possible geodynamic models for the exact patches where we see slow slip and tremors is, is going to be important for these zones. Okay. So if we return to the metamorphic dehydration plots that we saw here, what we can see is that this dehydration is occurring in these mafic lithologies and at, at the depths that we see slow slip and tremor and could be a nice in situ fluid source um, at these slow slip and tremor depths. And this is consistent with isotopic studies from some exhumed terrains like Jekyll et al 2018, actually from the Arosa zone and some of my own um, isotopic constraints. But we can ask the question what um, dehydration reactions are actually releasing this water. So if we wanted to go to the rock record and think about what we might actually see um, evidence for, we, we can think about what dehydration reactions we see. And so if we zoom into Guerrero in Mexico, we can take a look at this. So here I'm just showing the map of Mexico and the PT path for Guerrero. This is where the slab flattens out here. Um, and that's where we have our tremor and slow slip in this zone. Um, and so what I'm going to show you is a series of these box diagrams, um, these mineral box plots. And so what I'm showing here on the y-axis is the mineral volume. And then on the x-axis, I'm showing um, this is just sort of along that PT path. And so I'm showing pressure here, but temperatures on the top. So this box diagram is just showing the minerals that are present as we move along this PT path right here. Um, and you can see if I plot on here, the weight percent water that's bound within this rock is that when chlorite breaks down, um, there is this big decrease in mineral bound water um, right here. And this coincides really nicely with the depths that we observe tremor within this zone. So along this intermediate path here, we have chlorite breakdown and the growth of uh, calcic amphibole, epidote, garnet, and eventually umphacite, um, which is resulting in about two weight percent water that is lost at these depths. And this water could readily produce these high pore fluid pressures that we might see. Um, this is along the cold path. So then this is again, following this, this cold path. This is just to take into account uncertainty um, here in our models. 
And we can see rather than having chlorate breakdown at the conditions of, of tremor, what we see is that we actually have breakdown of lawsonite. So um, we're in lawsonite Lucia species at this like colder path here. Um, and that breakdown here then produces, uh, you know, two and a half wave percent water. Um, so at these cold paths, we see lawsonite breakdown and growth of epidote. And then along this warm path, again, we see this breakdown of, of chlorite here and growth of epidote, um, omphacite, um, and, and garnet and some calcic amphiboles. Um, so what I think this is telling us is there's not necessarily one single um, metamorphic reaction that's producing these fluids, but there could be a lot of different metamorphic reactions, but they could all still individually, if they're seen by these rocks, see uh, the production over a narrow depth range of one to three weight percent water. Um, and, and so the breakdown of chlorite and lawsonite seems to be important and the um, growth of epidote, amphibole and garnet are, are what we see happening in these zones. Um, okay, I'm almost done. Um, I'm trying to be thoughtful about the time. Um, so the question of where these metamorphic fluids are produced, I think some of them may be produced at depth and migrate up along the plate interface. Um, but I think that we can see these metamorphic reactions at these in situ conditions. So these dehydration reactions along these warm PT paths um, are producing an in situ fluid source for these high pore fluid pressures. Um, and, and we're seeing breakdown of chlorite and lawsonite in mafic rocks, so in the subducting slab that are producing this water that may lead to slow slip and tremor. And so this opens up a bunch of questions that maybe some of you in the audience could begin to answer um, or would like to help me answer. Um, what are the time scales of these fluid releases? Is there enough fluid to produce these lithostatic pore fluid pressures that we would require um, to activate these frictional mechanisms? And um, can we find evidence for this in the exhumed rock record? Um, I would like to know. So. Um, in conclusion, the constraints that I've been able to um, start to provide for slow earthquakes. Um, this is a fluid rich environment. We see this from the rock record. Um, we could activate these uh, frictional mechanisms with these transient or these periods of high pore fluid pressures. We see a lot of variability in the lithologies here, which manifests itself in the variability in rheology and ability for some transient rheologies to develop that would be controlled by these pore fluid pressures. So viscous deformation is going to accommodate tectonic creeping rates at these lower pore fluid pressures, and that at high pore fluid pressures, we can activate these frictional deformation mechanisms, specifically in minerals like talc and chlorite. So these mafic to ultramafic rocks and some of these rocks that are metasomatic products become incredibly important. Um, and we see evidence from the isotopic um, record of signatures of metamorphic and potentially mafic fluid sources. And from our petrologic and thermodynamic modeling, um, we can show that it is possible to have a lot of fluids that are produced in situ um, within the slab. And so what I think that this means is that metamorphism is, is incredibly important for the production of these slow earthquakes, uh, which satisfies me as a metamorphic petrologist. And I want to just end on this. Um, beautiful photograph of um, the Cascadia subduction zone from space. I live right right here, um, <laughs> if you can see. Um, and you know there are 12 million people that live on this subduction zone, and this is just one of the subduction zones in the U.S. And this is just one country. And so I think um, doing subduction zone science, even you know <laughs> from the metamorphic rock record, can bear a lot on. Our, our understanding of the slip behaviors of these zones, which has big implications for um, being able to understand seismic hazard in these areas and, and better prepare ourselves for these devastating earthquakes. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Katie. I'll give you a round of applause. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I'm sure people are gonna have questions for Katie. Oh, Mong Hans. Quick off the mark. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. It's really exciting seeing petrology and modeling together. I have two questions actually. The, the first question is um, related to that phase di uh, PT diagram you show where you have the tectonic stress and uh, the strain, and then you locate where the tectonic loading strain and during the slow slip. I was wondering because the slow state is not happening all the time, they are episodic. So yeah. they are actually the strings switching back and forth. So I guess my mm -hmm. first question is whether 
does that suggest there's a transition between like dislocation, pressure solution creep all the time, or is there a dominant process? And yeah, so you're talking about question later. this diagram? Yeah, this one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And uh, it's, it's, there's certainly, right, we know that we have creeping, tectonic creeping that's happening all the time, even in the zones that host so slip. We know this from our, G, our GPS observations of these zones. Um, so there has to be some transition and transient behavior that allows you to then get into these slow slip events. Um, I haven't spent very much time thinking about that, frankly. I think what, 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 is, what would be controlling sort of whether you have pressure solution creep or maybe activation of these frictional mechanisms is, is, the, is the pore fluid pressure. So the model that I like in my head, I didn't explicitly say this in the talk and maybe that's my bad, but is this idea that like when you have, you have to have fluids present along within these rocks to have pressure solution creep be active, right? Because we have to have some grain boundary fluid that's allowing the dissolution and then reprecipitation of this material. So you can't be dry, but if you don't have a really high pore fluid pressure, even if you're like, you know, at like 70% of lithostatic pore fluid pressures, you could have pressure solution be sort of the dominant deformation mechanism sort of controlling the rheology of these rocks. Um, but if you can have these periods of transient elevations in pore fluid pressures, potentially through these dehydration reactions, right? If we have some dehydration reaction where we have a bunch of metabasalt that's releasing a bunch of fluids into the plate interface and you accumulate these high pore fluid pressures, then you would switch from the dominant mechanism in, along the whole plate interface to be pressure solution creep within the schists to be frictional deformation within these um, within these like talc schists and um, and chlorite schists potentially. Now that would mean that you wouldn't necessarily shut off deformation within the the pressure solution creep within the the meta sedimentary rocks, but in terms of the entire plate velocity, it would be accommodating such a small amount compared to the amount that would be accommodated during these slow slip events when you have these, these much higher plate velocities. I don't know if that answered your question. I hope it did. I think sort of. Can, I, can yeah. I ask my question? So in the beginning of your talk, you mentioned you know, velocity strengthening, weakling, friction. And coincidentally, I actually read your EPSL paper a few <laughs> months ago. So that immediately reminds me of Kellen Wayne's paper, I guess he and his student published in Nature a couple of years back, where they're yeah, trying yeah. to answer the, you know, to answer why those, why SSE exists or do doesn't exist in some subduction zone. And there's sort of a combination of the viscous and the friction. So mm -hmm. I was, I guess my question is based on your modeling approach, then how do we put the A minus B stuff into that model or into your yeah. model? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I am not a friction person, but Melody is clearly. <laughs> so um, I've learned all of this from her. So um, yeah, so essentially what she did in this paper is she did sort of the same stuff that I did here for this meta sedimentary rock, but she did it for like all of these lithologies and using all of these constituent relations that we know for, you know, talc schists and for chloride schists and for calcite schists and, and all of this stuff. Um, and so she was using, right, the mechanical data that we have for friction in talc or friction in chlorate, and then modeled varying the pore fluid pressure, made an idealized plate boundary where we used the, the ratios of, of thicknesses that we actually observe in the erosive zone for these different rock types to try to think about how thick these would be and what amount of, um, of the plate velocity these rocks could accommodate at various pore fluid pressure levels using these constitutive relations. And so what she saw is that talc and chlorate both have this rate strengthening or velocity strengthening relationship. And at these high pore fluid pressures, even a really thin zone of talc could, because it's so weak, accommodate so much of the deformation along here that it could accommodate a slow slip event um, within this zone. Um, yeah, I, I think that's really interesting. And from my perspective as a, as a metamorphic petrologist, I'm really interested in talc. Um, and I've actually talked with Will Hoover a bunch about this, um, one of Sarah's graduate students about sort of uh, how you can get talc to be present in some of these zones. Cause you wouldn't just expect talc present in a typical ultramafic rock. You have to add silica to it 
you know, metasomatize it with silica, or you have to add magnesium to a more felsic rock to get talc to stabilize at these PT conditions. So there's, there's, I mean, we see talc here, so it's there, but it's interesting to think about how we can get it there. And that's, an, to me, really satisfying to have another sort of chemical process become really important in the rheology of these zones. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Mong Han. Uh, next up, we have a question from Wen Lu. Um, hi, Kylie. Hi. Um, nice talk. Uh, I have a question about uh, your high pressure box. I can see why it has a, a shallow upper bound, right? But you also have a lower upper bound, I mean, lower bound, so the depth, right? Yeah. So then what controls the lower depth? Uh, because the reason I'm asking is that uh, you also have fluids migrating up. When the fluids are migrating up, obviously it's a pressure driven, right? So, so there are higher pressure down there. So why is that uh, your high pore pressure zone is uh, having this uh, lower bounds and uh, what happens uh, below that? So why cannot they build a high pore pressure? And that's, I think, uh, can also relate to, you know, those uh, mechanisms that uh, you care about. Well, we all do, well, at least I do, uh, uh, about the slow slope event. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, that's an excellent question. And I've been asked that before. Um, so, and, and actually this goes back to that paper by Keelan Wang. Um, that you were talking about hung on just a minute ago and you mentioned, um, yeah. So what that would require is there's a couple of ways you could invoke something. I don't know if we really know. Um, and it would be great to look at the rock record. It's just, these things are really hard to even, there's so many things that are happening in, in these rocks. It's really hard to tell what is actually evidence of this transient process or not, even at the conditions where we definitely know we have slow slip. So going to a deeper depth and trying to identify why we don't, why we don't have slow slip and tremor at, you know, say like 80 or 90 kilometers depth um, in the plate interface where we know we have metamorphic fluids that are produced is a good question. One idea that people have had is that you have to have some sort of like permeable, impermeable cap on top of it on top of the plate interface at these depths here. Let me go to um, one of my tectonic cartoons of the subduction zone so you can just see this. Yeah, so one idea is that like right here, you have this high pore fluid pressure that builds here because you have some impermeable cap here that doesn't allow this water to escape. And so you're able to build up that pore fluid pressure here. Whereas if you have dehydration down here, maybe that water is just gonna go into that mantle wedge um, and hydrate the mantle wedge and not create some sort of, you know, it's not gonna get trapped in here. Um, I think that's an interesting idea to think about. Another idea is that potentially the porosity structure changes so that you're just not a lot able to build up these high pore fluid pressures or something here, or potentially, I would think you would have talc down here too, but if talc and chloride are really important, there may be some stability, something that's happening with the, the lithology that might actually be hosting slow slip that you might lose at these deeper depths. I, I don't find that as convincing from a, um, petrologic perspective, but I, I also frankly don't find this impermeable cap at that, that like satisfying either. Um, so I think that's an excellent question. And I think that's still certainly outstanding right now. It's like, why, why do we see this at this very specific depth range and, and not deeper? Um, and it certainly requires more interrogation. So unsatisfying answer, but more work to be done. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Wenli. Um, so I have a question. Um, I wondered if anyone had tried to um, include the downgoing sediment package and like the variable composition of that. And like, if you're subducting more carbonate or something, is it possible to incorporate that into your model? Yeah, so yes, people have certainly thought about this and like Whitney Bear and her group are doing a lot of work thinking about the rheological implications of sediment subduction. Um, and also like there's clearly gonna be a really different um, uh, pattern of, of, of fluid production if you're dominated by, um, you know, uh, different compositions of, of um, 
of sediments. Um, so Melody tested this a little bit in, in that 2019 paper where she said, okay, if we take a, this calc schist that we have evidence for and, and use the, you know, the rheology of that rock is gonna be controlled by a calcite. Let's say if we have like a lot of calcite bearing rocks going down, how does this change this story? So if you're like subducting some carbonate platform or something versus some like, you know, you know, politic composition or something. Um, and it does change it a little bit. Um, calcite is, um, deforming by dislocation creep at these conditions, um, not by pressure solution creep. Um, it's not soluble, I think, at these conditions. Um, I could be wrong on that. I, I'm not a calcite person. I haven't spent much time thinking about it. I need to, um, but it does change things. I think the, the interesting thing to me is that um, what it changes is that that is gonna be what's gonna be accommodating your viscous tectonic creeping strain rates. And it's still not gonna accommodate slow slip. Um, uh, because these viscous mechanisms just, they, they need, they require higher shear stresses. Unless you were subducting like, you know, a, a very, very thick package and you were able to get like two or three kilometers of this down there, which maybe in some places you do have that. Um, but I don't think in the places where we're seeing slow slip and tremor happening, that's what's getting subducted down there. But you can play games where you can, you know, change the ratio of these materials that go down there and think about what that's going to imply for the for the rheology at various pore fluid pressure conditions in these zones. Um, from a fluid production perspective, it is also going to change things, certainly, because um, you're going to have different dehydration reactions that are seen by different compositions. And so I only explored like, you know, four typical compositions, but there's so many other compositions you could think about that might be really important. And none of those are, you know, taking into account any metasomatism or, you know, evolution in their chemistry. The only thing that's happening to them is they're losing water. Um, so there's certainly these metasomatic processes that are building these weird composition rocks that might see different metamorphic reactions at different depths that are gonna do things too. So there's lots of knobs to twist, um, but I think taking the simplest approach is um, the first step, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, are there any last call for questions? I don't see any hands up, but um, if you wave, I will, or just shout out, we're good. Okay, then let's thank Kaylee again for a really, really interesting talk. Thanks for starting us off. <laughs>